uh, I should like to tell uh, everybody that uh, today's session uh, will be recorded. Uh, so you are aware that uh, the, the recording will take place. And also it is our aim subsequently to issue the recording to YouTube so that uh, others who have not been able to participate in the session today can watch the presentation at a later stage. So this was just uh, for you to know that uh, we are recording the session. Uh, I should like, uh, first of all, very much to uh, welcome now uh, Catherine Titi to uh, the seminar. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for doing this uh, presentation. Catherine is uh, an associate professor at uh, the University of Paris, uh, Pantheon Assas. Uh, and she will be speaking today on uh, the um, on the issue of nationality and representation on the international bench. Uh, Catherine's presentation today is uh, part of a lecture series, uh, which is uh, organized by the Faculty of Law's Study Hub for International Economic Law and Development, and is also uh, part of an association with the European Society for International Law. And uh, with these words, uh, and I will keep the presentation short because we've been delayed a, a little bit. Uh, I would like to uh, pass on the word uh, to you, Catherine, for uh, the, the presentation that you've prepared for us today. And I, I look very much forward to hearing it. So thank you so much uh, and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Henrik, for this kind presentation. Uh, thank you to the University of uh, Copenhagen, uh, SHIELD and i uh, for uh, having me today. Uh, also, I would like to thank the, uh, the European Society of uh, International Law uh, and uh, uh, in particular, Ghana and uh, Anna in the, uh, um, in, in the board um, who are responsible for uh, the easy uh, lectures. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Joanna uh, for hosting me uh, virtually uh, and uh, uh, also uh, Gunish and uh, uh, Theodora, who are my other two contacts uh, at the university. Uh, and uh, uh, I will close this very short introduction by saying that uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, next time uh, we can see each other in, in person, it feels a bit lonely uh, to be doing a presentation from uh, home. Uh, right, so the topic of my presentation is uh, nationality and uh, representation on the international bench. And I think ultimately I will have less time uh, rather, I will not have the time to go through everything that uh, I would have liked uh, to go through. Uh, let me start by saying that um, it is generally accepted that uh, the nationality of the international adjudicator can affect his or her decision making. It has been said uh, that adjudicators cannot be expected uh, to arrive at a court or tribunal as tabula rasa, so as clean slates, uh, nor by donning judicial robes do they cease to be human, strip themselves of all predilections and become passionless thinking machines. Judges sitting on international courts have often uh, spent their careers in national service as diplomats, legal advisors, administrators, politicians, and they may identify with the interests of the state of their nationality. Empirical studies on voting patterns in international courts show that judges on the international bench uh, tend to vote in favor of their home state. A particular example is that of Italian judge Luigi Ferrari Bravo, who sitting on the European Court of Human Rights descended from the majority on a set of 133 judgments uh, concerning alleged Italian violations of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, political scientists have tried to explain uh, the role of um, uh, courts and one might say indirectly the role of nationality uh, through um, the principal agent model uh, to argue that international adjudicatory bodies are not really independent uh, and so indirectly nationality matters. Uh, the, the thrust of this uh, uh, principal agent theory as applied to international courts is that states control 
what appear to be independent international courts uh, by the capacity they have uh, to revoke uh, their delegation contract. Um, so this model is not really very suitable uh, to help us understand uh, international adjudicative bodies, uh, since they, the states don't really have this uh, delegation contract, they can't really, uh, they can't directly, uh, they can't fire the judges, they can't uh, make the court disappear if they're not happy uh, with it, which is in a way what the principal agent uh, model assumes. Uh, and, uh, and so another model has been suggested, uh, that of a principal trustee relationship. Uh, according to the principal trustee model, uh, trustees, so courts or judges, are selected um, because, um, rather judges are selected because of their personal and professional reputation and their granted independent decision-making authority. When it comes to making sense of nationality in particular, uh, nationality is one element of the identity of an international adjudicator that may affect decision-making. Uh, but not necessarily because of any contract theory, not because the state has a contract uh, with a national judge, the judge of its nationality uh, sitting on the bench. Nationality can have an impact on one's outlook, on how one approaches legal issues in general, or even how one approaches specific disputes. At the same time, a nationality is one among several elements uh, that may impact decision making. Other elements of the identity of the international judge uh, are ethnicity, uh, country of legal education, country of residence, uh, whether one comes from in, an industrialized or a developing country, um, gender, religion, and, and so on. So I will not be discussing these, uh, but I think we must be conscious uh, of these other elements uh, that can affect decision making uh, to better understand what nationality may mean for decision making. At the same time, nationality is not only relevant as an argument to discredit a judge who is seen as potentially partial to the state of his nationality, it is also an element that confers legitimacy on international dispute settlement. International courts must be representative of their membership. This requires the inclusion of diverse nationalities in their ranks. The distribution of seats on an international court, ensuring representation of different nationalities, is a seminal component of such legitimacy. Uh, so much so that representation uh, can become a condition to allow states to join a court. So if states don't have the opportunity to have their judge on the bench, maybe they won't uh, join a court. There has to be some kind of representation of the membership of a court. States expect to be represented, even if the notion of representation seems to be at odds with the concept of judicial independence. A council is meant to represent, not judges. So nationality matters. It is not astonishing that the statutes of international courts and tribunals ordinarily make at least some reference to nationality. In doing so, they often seek to reconcile the challenges that attach to the presence of judges of the nationality of one of the disputing parties on the bench. So I will be calling them national judges. So by the term national judge, I will mean a judge uh, who is um, the national of a state uh, and uh, uh, also uh, the judge who, is, who sits in a dispute when the state of his nationality takes part in the dispute, is one of the disputing parties. Uh, and um, the difficulty, so on the one hand is uh, the, the challenge of uh, what happens with when we have national judges on the bench uh, and we have a state uh, that is a disputing party uh, that has the same, that is, uh, the, the judge has the nationality of that state. And on the other hand, the difficulties that the absence of national judges would entail, uh, such as uh, by uh, what international court statutes do. Uh, they, they, for example, 
debar co-nationals from sitting together. So they say only one judge of every nationality uh, can sit on the bench, no two judges of the same nationality. Or um, they allow the appointment of judges ad hoc uh, when a disputing party does not have one of its nationals on the bench. So these are provisions in the statutes of international courts uh, that try to deal with the various dilemmas uh, that the presence and absence uh, of um, national judges uh, can present. The statutes of a minority of courts uh, do not care very much about nationality. This is true in particular of regional integration courts, including notably the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Free Trade Area, so this is the, the EFTA court, and the Caribbean Court of Justice. Uh, these courts are unique in that while established at the supranational level, they partake of an essentially domestic, if sui generis, nature. I mean, we can disagree about this, um, but uh, I think they are not comparable, they're not truly comparable uh, to other international courts, uh, including regional human rights courts. And for this reason, I will not be dealing at all uh, with the regional integration courts. Uh, if I refer to them, it will only be um, exceptionally. Nationality and representation become relevant to two distinct aspects of the composition of an international adjudicatory body. First, in relation to the body as a whole, and second, in relation to the constitution of particular chambers or divisions. Uh, so initially, I, I meant to discuss both, uh, but I will move, I will pass over the first part, which is nationality and representation on the court as a whole, and I will focus on nationality and representation in particular chambers uh, or divisions, uh, because I think it's more interesting to be able to go more into depth uh, rather than give a very generic overview. Uh, I would just like to say that what I mean by nationality and representation on the court as a whole are issues such as um, whether a court statute provides for election or appointment regardless of nationality, uh, the statute of the ICJ does, for instance, uh, questions around geographical representation, uh, so uh, is representation limited to the court's membership? Uh, can we have judges from countries who are not members of the court? Uh, do we have representation of the major legal systems, equitable geographical representation? Um, what does representation mean for qualifications? Um, and, um, and, and so on. Uh, so I will uh, focus then uh, in the, the rest of the presentation, so in the bulk of the, of the presentation, on nationality and representation, in particular uh, chambers or divisions. And in this respect, I will be discussing national judges, and uh, I will focus on judges ad hoc, uh, which is the the other part of the of the same coin when we don't have a national judge uh, we may be able to have a judge ad hoc uh, on the bench um, now provisions on national judges and judges ad hoc are closely entwined the institution of judges ad hoc exists because national judges can sit in cases involving the state of their nationality as a disputing uh, party I will discuss separately two types of courts because they, they deal with these issues in different ways. So on the one hand, we have classic international courts dealing with interstate disputes and they deal in one way with nationality and uh, judges ad hoc. And on the other hand, we have regional human rights courts uh, and um, they deal differently uh, with um, nation national judges and uh, judges ad hoc, uh, and even between them, um, they deal uh, differently. So first, classic international courts. So courts like the, the ICJ and uh, ITLOS. Well, let's start with the ICJ and ITLOS. The statutes of the ICJ and ITLOS affirm that judges who have the nationality of a disputing party 
retain their right to sit in the case. So when um, there is um, uh, there is a, a chamber that is constituted to hear a dispute. If there is a national judge, if there, if there is an, a judge who has the nationality of one of the disputing parties, this judge retains his or her right uh, to hear the case. We have some exceptions. Uh, so, for example, at the ICJ, if the president of the court is a national of one of the disputing parties, uh, he or she must relinquish uh, the presidential functions in respect uh, of that uh, given uh, case. Uh, and uh, national judges can also be present in uh, divisions of three established to decide appeals uh, as part of the appellate body as it has uh, functioned uh, so far. Now, since judges are allowed to sit in cases involving the state of their nationality, if one of the disputing states has its national judge on the bench, but the other disputing state does not, some statutes allow uh, the state that does not have its own judge on the bench to select a judge. This is a natural consequ consequence of the principle of the equality of states under public international law, uh, but also of the need to respect the principle of equality of arms. Concretely, the statute of the ICJ provides that if the court includes on the bench a judge who has the nationality of one of the disputing parties, any other party may choose a person to sit as judge. And the statute goes further uh, to essentially allow a disputing party to select a judge ad hoc um, if it doesn't have its national judge on the bench, no matter if the other, irrespective of whether the other disputing party actually has a national judge. And <laughs> I'm sorry. The possibility of choosing a judge ad hoc is irrespective of the reason why a party does not have a national judge in the particular chamber of division. If the state has a national judge, but at some stage this judge becomes unable to sit, the state concerned uh, becomes entitled to uh, choose a judge ad hoc. Um, ITLOS has a, a particularity, uh, so the provisions at ITLOS are similar to those um, at the uh, ICJ. Um, so the, the difference or the particularity of ITLOS is that, in fact, it allows even non-state entities uh, to select a judge ad hoc. So this is because ITLOS uh, can have as disputing parties also non-state uh, entities. In contrast to the ICJ and ICLOS, there is no provision for judges ad hoc in relation to the appellate body of the WTO. So this is what happens with uh, classic, and quotation marks, international courts uh, dealing with uh, interstate disputes. Now, human rights courts are different. The procedural rules of human rights courts also provide for national judges and judges ad hoc. Uh, but they are different. First, a distinction needs to be drawn between individual cases, so disputes that involve applications that have been lodged uh, by individuals, and interstate disputes. Both um, the European Convention on Human Rights and the American Convention on Human Rights provide for interstate dispute settlement. And uh, we have um, at least 24 uh, interstate uh, cases that have been uh, brought before the European Court of Human Rights. We don't have um, any cases under any interstate cases under the uh, before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. But either way, the majority of human rights cases uh, concern uh, individual applications. Now, this means. I mean, this makes all the difference, and I will explain why it makes all the difference. Um, but I would like to draw your attention to also something else, and that is that in individual human rights cases, alleged victims often have the same nationality as the respondent state. This means that the national judge of the respondent state 
is also the victims a national judge. Um, this would be different if we imagine, so in human rights disputes are mixed disputes. So on, on one hand, individual human rights disputes that decide individual applications are mixed disputes. On the one hand, we have an individual, on the other hand, a state. Now, if we have in the future uh, an investment court system, uh, the investment court would also have mixed disputes. On the one hand, a state, on the other hand, a most likely private investor. Uh, but their things would be different because um, the, um, the investor would always be a foreign investor. Uh, so the, uh, the national judge of the respondent state would not be the national judge of the, the investor. So I close this, um, this small uh, parenthesis. Um, and um, under the, the current rules in human rights courts, uh, to the extent that uh, the institution of judges at hog is allowed, only the state has the right to appoint a judge at hoc, not the individual applicant. So if the state does not have a national judge on the bench, but is allowed to appoint a judge at hoc, um, the individual uh, the alleged victim of a human rights violation does not have a corresponding right to also appoint a judge ad hoc. The European Court of Human Rights is different from other courts examined uh, so far, uh, also in, in different from the international in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in that it ensures full, full representation. All contracting states have their own judge on the court. And uh, the, the European Convention on Human Rights provides that um, the, the judge elected in respect of a disputing party will sit as an ex officio member of the chamber and the grand chamber. So immediately when there is a dispute, the national judge of the disputing party is selected as a judge uh, to sit in, in, the, in the case um, if it is decided by the chamber uh, or um, the grand chamber. And the chamber and the grand chamber have respectively seven and 17 uh, judges. Uh, in the case of committees of three judges, um, if the judge elected in respect of the disputing party uh, is not a member of the committee, the committee may invite that judge to take the place of one of its members. So if the dispute is decided by three uh, judges and the national judge is not part of this committee, he or she may be invited uh, to sit in the case. Exceptionally, when we have a single judge formation, the national judge cannot sit. So if it's one judge deciding the case, uh, which I think is very uh, logical, uh, that judge cannot have the nationality uh, of the disputing uh, state. If the permanent judge is unable to sit, then the institution of the judge ad hoc uh, kicks in. But this is not the traditional institution of the judge ad hoc uh, as discussed so far, uh, because um, in fact, in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, states have already given uh, beforehand uh, the names of judges who could uh, act as judges ad hoc. Uh, so it is not really an ad hoc selection uh, of the judge at the moment of the dispute. Uh, so in a way, judges ad hoc at the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights resemble a little regular judges uh, in the sense that um, they have been uh, nominated uh, beforehand. Uh, judges ad hoc at the European Court of Human Rights are allowed both in interstate and um, uh, individual uh, applications. Um, and um, I will move now to the, um, uh, on to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, like also the African Court of Human Rights, uh, is different in that it does not allow national judges and judges ad hoc uh, to sit uh, when, um, well, it does not allow national judges. So if a state party to the dispute has a judge uh, on the bench, the, the, the judge cannot sit, cannot hear the dispute involving the state of his or her nationality. Uh, and uh, there is no, uh, there, there is 
there is no possibility to appoint a judge ad hoc. This has not always been like that. Uh, this uh, changed uh, with um, advisory opinion OC 2009. Um, so uh, this was 2009, 2009. Uh, before that, this was not so clear, although in fact the provisions of the, uh, the Inter-American Convention, sorry, the American Convention on Human Rights um, seemed to apply uh, the, the rule of national judges and judges ad hoc only to interstate disputes, uh, the practice of the court had been to allow uh, ad hoc judges and national judges to sit even in, um, in individual uh, disputes. Um, and uh, I think it's also interesting how this practice uh, started. Um, it started um, with the court's very first contentious cases, uh, which were brought against Honduras uh, in 1986, and at the time, the Honduran judge recused himself from hearing the cases, uh, presumably considering that uh, he should not hear a case involving uh, the country of his nationality. Um, and then on the same day that he recused himself, the president of the court uh, invited Honduras to, uh, to appoint uh, a judge ad hoc. So this changed in, in 2009. Uh, and uh, it is no longer possible uh, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, for a judge to hear a case involving the state of his nationality uh, in individual disputes. And uh, it is not possible for a state to appoint a judge ad hoc. The presence of uh, national judges in cases involving the state of their nationality and the institution of judges ad hoc can serve to both decrease and increase the legitimacy of the adjudicative process. They can lessen legitimacy when national judges and judges ad hoc are seen as partial to the state of their nationality or to their appointing state. They can bolster legitimacy when states are intent on the presence of a national judge or of their judge uh, as a condition in order to submit to the jurisdiction of the court. So some states will feel happier if they're able to choose a judge ad hoc, uh, or if they know that they will have the national judge uh, hear the, the dispute or a, a dispute uh, involving them. Uh, the institution of judges ad hoc, I think it's worth particular attention. Uh, the term judge ad hoc seems a contradiction in itself. We tend to understand judges as permanent, whatever permanence means but certainly not as ad hoc, arbitrators are ad hoc, not judges. And uh, of course the judge ad hoc is often seen as a remnant uh, of uh, arbitration. And uh, sometimes the, the skepticism that attaches to, to arbitrators uh, sometimes considered to vote in favor of their appointing uh, party also concerns judges uh, who are appointed ad hoc. Yet, despite the criticisms that have been leveled at the institution of judges ad hoc, the institution exists because states have created it. Uh, that judges ad hoc can broaden the acceptance of an international court uh, is something that is um, true, not only at the moment when a court is created, uh, but also once a court has been established. So, I will now discuss a little the, the pros and cons of um, judges ad hoc. On the one hand, judges must be absolute, absolutely impartial and independent. And there is a concern that the institution of judges ad hoc is at odds with the principle that no one should be judged in his own case. And as such, it, it may be contrary to judicial independence and impartiality. Empirical studies across international courts have shown that national judges and judges ad hoc tend to vote in favor of their national state or of their appointing uh, state, with judges ad hoc demonstrating a higher bias in favor of their nominating state than national judges. So a judge ad hoc a judge appointed ad hoc to hear a dispute is more likely to vote in favor of the, the state that appointed him or her uh, rather than 
the national judge, the regular judge of a state when that state is one of the disputing parties. Of course, that does not mean that national judges and judges at hoc are forever sympathetic uh, to the interests of their home state or to their appointing state. Sometimes judges of the same nationality can arrive at different results. And uh, of course, it cannot be excluded that at least sometimes uh, judges vote in a certain way because they genuinely uh, believe uh, what they uh, vote for uh, rather than they are influenced because um, uh, the state of their nationality uh, supports one or, or other argument or the state of their nationality is involved. It is also a fact that disputing parties have sometimes abandoned their right to appoint a judge ad hoc, including when the adverse party had a judge of its nationality on the bench. Now, admittedly, some of these cases happened, uh, cases of non-appointment of a judge ad hoc happened when the state that would have the right to appoint a judge ad hoc, in fact, refused to participate in, in the proceedings. Uh, so, they, I mean, the statement has to be taken with a, with a pinch of salt. Some regret practical problems that the institution of judges ad hoc ha has thrown up, uh, such as the need for more office space and its negative impact on court uh, finances. Uh, for example, in 2018-2019, uh, judges ad hoc represented more than 2% of the budget of the ICJ. Uh, now, I'm not entirely sure if 2% is really, um, to me, 2% doesn't sound like a, a very important um, uh, part of the budget. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, some uh, say that uh, judges ad hoc judges ad hoc have a, uh, they lament the negative impact uh, that judges ad hoc have on uh, a court's finances. Um, moreover, heavily involved judges ad hoc who may try to ensure that each and every argument of the state that appointed them is addressed, uh, it has been said they can bloat the court's workload and um, in fact they can slow down uh, the process. On the other hand, Various arguments have been put forward to explain the presence of national judges, sorry, of judges ad hoc. According to some of these arguments, the rationale for the institution of the judge ad hoc is similar to that for the presence of national judges. The arguments point to a mistrust in the regular formation of the court and reveal an implicit assumption that council have failed in their task of representation. There is this assumption that there is a need uh, for the judge ad hoc, so that in fact the judge ad hoc can represent, quotation marks, uh, the state. Uh, but a representation is the role of council, not of uh, judges. Um, it, is, um, it has been said, for instance, uh, that judges ad hoc uh, can help the court understand issues of national jurisprudence or domestic law that may require specialized knowledge, and they can appreciate uh, the culture, legal traditions, and problems of the state of their nationality. However, such arguments are not entirely, uh, I would say, correct. For the similar reason that most often than not, judges ad hoc actually do not have the nationality of the appointing state. So these issues about appreciating uh, national jurisprudence and domestic law um, and having specialized knowledge uh, to understand all these things do not apply. And um, it is further questionable to what extent an international court uh, how often does a national court, sorry, an international court uh, have to apply uh, domestic uh, law? So, uh, related statements include that the judge ad hoc make sure that so far as it is reasonable, every relevant, every relevant argument in favor of the party that has appointed him has been fully appreciated in the course of collegial consideration and ultimately is reflected uh, in any separate or dissenting opinion that, that he may write. So this was a quote. Um, this is made easy by procedural reality because in fact, judges ad hoc are the first to take the floor. Uh, and so they may set the tone uh, of the debate. 
having said that, judges at hoc at the ICJ, also national judges, are typically not part of a drafting committee. Um, this is not the case at ICLOS. Uh, but that means um, the, the, the impact they can have is not during the, the drafting. Again, it is the role of counsel, not that of judges, to represent a party and make its arguments heard. And it is the role of experts to clarify aspects of domestic law. If the court lacks information, uh, it uh, may require the presence of experts, uh, but not uh, turn a member of the, of the court into an expert uh, who during deliberations without the presence um, of the other uh, party uh, offer one-sided information uh, to uh, the other judges. A further opinions that have been advanced in favor of the institution of the judge ad hoc, uh, other judges ad hoc can help with the drafting of a judgment. Uh, again, this is not true to the extent uh, that, uh, at least in, in the courts where judges ad hoc cannot be part of a drafting uh, committee. Um, and um, um, again, there are many references to the judge ad hoc uh, being able to offer diplomatic representation uh, to the state. Um, and um, um, at this point, a distinction also needs to be made between courts hearing interstate cases and courts um, hearing um, mixed disputes where such as in, in the human rights context, um, the system is not just made by states for states, this is for a dispute before the ICJ, but for a dispute, a human rights dispute or an investment dispute, we have third parties uh, that are beneficiaries of the, the protection. Uh, and, uh, and so um, the, the ultimate users of a system are, I mean, whether the, the ultimate users of a system are only states or states and private parties uh, can have an impact on the appropriateness of the institution of judges at hoc. Another argument is that the institution of judges at hoc is explained uh, by reference to the principle of equality of arms. If we assume that the national judge will on, always um, favor a little his or her home state, uh, it is important to allow the other party too uh, to have its own judge. And this also reveals how closely the institution of um, a national judge on the bench hearing uh, the, a case involving the state of his nationality is uh, with the, the institution of the judge ad hoc. Uh, but a distinction needs to be drawn uh, between allowing judges ad hoc in order to ensure equality of arms, uh, such as when only one disputing party has a national judge on the bench and we want to give the other disputing party the opportunity to have uh, its own judge, uh, and allowing judges ad hoc uh, when none of the disputing parties has a national uh, judge on the bench. So if uh, none of the disputing parties has a national judge, it may be possible to say that there is no reason uh, to appoint uh, a judge ad hoc. Uh, a further argument must be considered. International courts need to convince states uh, to become members and submit to their jurisdiction and uh, um, states tend to feel more comfortable with the presence of a national judge uh, when, uh, when and if there is a case involving them and with uh, the ability to appoint a judge ad hoc. This was very obvious in uh, the submissions that were sent uh, to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights when um, they, the court decided, uh, they, when the court was deciding uh, whether it would allow national judges and judges ad hoc. So most states were in favor of national judges and, uh, and judges ad hoc. Um, however, these arguments must be put in perspective and um, notably they do not consider the differences between interstate and mixed disputes. They do not take into account um, the, the size of a particular chamber or division when you have uh, a, a chamber of um, uh, three judges and one of them uh, is um, a, uh, a national judge, you have, uh, if we say one of them is a, 
uh, is a national judge and the other one is a judge ad hoc uh, and uh, and then we have the president this is very much like um, arbitration uh, in fact uh, because um, essentially it's like you have um, uh, each party appoint um, in quotation marks a, a judge or not so there are elements to take into account that um, I don't have the time to go into such as are the judges uh, are national judges and judges that are hawk supernumerary? So are they added uh, to the regular division or do they replace judges um, of a regular division? So in some cases, we can actually have uh, such uh, chambers of three uh, deciding a dispute uh, where uh, two out of the three are the national judge uh, or the ad hoc judge or two national judges, uh, two ad hoc uh, judges. And um, um, equality of arms must be assured. Uh, so, and I will close with this, so that if one party has a national judge on the bench, either the other party should be allowed its own judge or the national judge should step down. However, a distinction must be drawn between, on the one hand, interstate disputes and mixed disputes. In mixed disputes, so in human rights disputes, uh, and um, if we think about the potential design of a future investment court, if the right to appoint a judge ad hoc is only accorded to the disputing state party, but the, the private party does not have uh, the same right, uh, then the institution of judges ad hoc uh, can uh, seem to be uh, problematic because there uh, there are issues that come up in relation to due process and in relation to the equality of arms. Um, essentially, if you allow only one party to have its own judge, whether it's a national judge or a judge ad hoc, um, you don't treat the two parties as equal. So I, I think I will stop here um i had a lot more that i would have liked to say and um, maybe if the issue comes up uh, i mean if there's any time i would like to say that something else i wanted to discuss and uh, i will not discuss now is the nationality of the judges at hoc what influence uh has uh, how how states choose the judges at hoc do they choose their own nationals as judges at hoc or they do they choose non-nationals and how does that impact uh, voting. So this is the one part that uh, I meant to discuss, but, but uh, since I, I've, I've been going more slowly than in my, uh, than when I tested uh, the, the time. Uh, so I will stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your comments uh, and uh, questions. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Catherine. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is what, what happens sometimes, you know, uh, in these uh, presentations, it's sometimes uh, it takes a little bit uh, longer than, uh, than what you have uh, prepared for. Uh, I would like to, uh, to invite participants to ask questions to you, but before I do so, uh, we have scheduled uh, just a five minute uh, uh, intervention uh, where uh, Joanna uh, has uh, prepared some, some comments uh, to you. And so before we move to uh, questions from the audience, I would like to uh, give you the floor now, Joanna, please. Thank you so much, Henrik. And uh, um, Catherine, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to comment on your uh, on your lecture. It's uh, It's been a pleasure. I, um, I think it's been such an excellent overview of uh, institutional and procedural solutions that have been adopted by different adjudicatory bodies um, in regard to nationality of the judges. Uh, and I think that it's been also great to have this occasion to um, to 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 see some of the popular myths um, debunked, the myths about how exactly the nationality of the judges uh, plays a role or might affect or not affect their decision making. And I also think that, as you mentioned at the end of your of your uh, presentation, um, this is a topic that has become particularly timely in the context of the ongoing uh, reform of the investor state dispute settlement and the system and the uh, and the plans for establishing the multilateral investment court. Uh, 
So, um, so in this vein, I would like to offer three comments. Uh, first of them goes to the, uh, it's conceptual in nature. It's, uh, it goes to um, the idea, the concept of equal, preserving equality of arms as one of the main procedural values to be preserved. Uh, and here I would like to uh, mention the classical safeguards that serve this purpose, uh, which are in judicial independence and impartiality. But the debate about impartiality has been actually over the past years also uh, broadened um, uh, by the discussion of neutrality. And it's, uh, um, I, I believe that uh, like spelling out um, how the uh, independence and neutrality uh, safeguards work um, in international adjudication uh, might uh, uh, might broaden the, the scope of the debate. So uh, if we uh, if we assume after Eric Voten that independence is always an independence from, uh, it means that judges are at liberty to uh, to ignore the preferences and biases of the outsiders. So they can develop legal opinions that are unconstrained by the preferences of other actors. So that would mean that uh, judges can, even if they are national judges, they can feel free to, uh, to um, not to be affected by the uh, attempts to influence their decision making made by the states, if it's the states that appointed them. Whereas neutrality is considered as uh, to be a quality of the adjudicators themselves, uh, actually neutrality of the uh, of the judges or arbitrators is part of the broader concept of the um, uh, of the procedural neutrality uh, and I believe there's been a uh, quite interesting um, debate on this issue taking place in the legal doctrine of arbitration also including investment arbitration how to um, how to preserve this value uh, I've, I have personally found it quite inspiring and I think that uh, in order to uh, keep the equality of arms throughout the proceedings, you actually need both, both uh, the independence and the neutrality of the forum and uh, of the adjudicators. And this leads me to the, uh, since the since investor state arbitration has been brought up, it also leads me to my second comment, um, which goes to the um, different solutions adopted in the rules of procedure or in the statutes of, uh, of different courts in regard to accepting um, uh, judges of the nationality of the parties uh, on, the, uh, on the international bench. And uh, in, the, um, in the article accompanying your, your lecture, uh, you are mentioning in this regard, in the context of investor state dispute settlement, uh, different sets of arbitration rules, um, including the ancestral rules um, uh, and the rules of uh, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, uh, LCIA and ICC. Uh, I found it extremely interesting. Uh, you contrast them to some extent with the statutes of the classical international courts, because those sets of rules uh, adopt either a, an explicitly friendly approach like the ancestral rules or a rather liberal uh, stance towards um, accepting an adjudicator um, of the nationality, same as, as one of the parties. Um, and I think that the, uh, the reason for that might be that those sets of rules have been created uh, uh, either not exclusively, uh, as is the case of the ancestral rules, or uh, perhaps even primarily, as is the case of the remaining sets of uh, rules by our specific arbitral institutions, for the purposes of commercial rather than investment investor state arbitration. And if the possibility of uh, like freedom to appoint the, uh, the, the arbitrator that is very frequently of the nationality of, of one of the parties is considered one of the cornerstones of the um, commercial arbitration process, um, it, uh, it naturally affects if we have the same set of rules um, applied in the investor state disputes, uh, then it comes with, uh, um, I guess, with, with all the luggage, with all the benefits and, and perils um, of such an application. Uh, and, and of course, we have the entire debate to what extent those types of rules are um, directly applicable to the situations in which we have uh, the, the mixed disputes where a state is also a party, um, as you mentioned throughout your lecture. And my third comment uh, goes to um, the discussion that was uh, indicated in your 
um, in your lecture as well, uh, which is about the possibility of um, appointing ad hoc judges uh, uh, in the uh, in investment disputes in the future mechanism that would be the, the multilateral investment court. Uh, what solutions should be or are recommended to be um, to be adopted in this regard? Uh, in particular, as you mentioned, if we um, have adjudication taking place in small divisions of, of three judges. Uh, if we allow for that, um, then we would de facto replicate arbitration appointment mechanisms. We wouldn't, it wouldn't make that much difference. So uh, I was thinking about it uh, also in the context of um, what kinds of doubts this might raise. Uh, you mentioned many of them um, uh, regarding the, uh, the lack of equality of arms if the investors are not allowed to, to, to appoint their own judges in response to the state's, um, uh, uh, state's judges. Uh, but I also, I, uh, in my opinion, actually nationality affects an adjudicator not only in the like uh, in the simple manner that uh, if uh, and, and your lecture shows it very well, it doesn't mean that if someone is an Italian judge, uh, they will always necessarily vote in favor uh, of the uh, of the Italian party in the deliberations. Uh, but I believe that the nationality also affects an adjudicator in a more um, indirect way, um, as it is most frequently the jurisdiction of their primary legal training. So uh, the legal concepts that the adjudicators apply, the arguments uh, that they use, they are strongly affected by the legal tradition in which they were, um, uh, they were primarily um, educated. And uh, I understand that in the classical public uh, international law courts, um, this is the problem that is uh, addressed by uh, ensuring diversity, um, but ensuring broad representation, uh, but uh, in the uh, in the investor state disputes, uh, when it comes to application of law and necessary competences that the adjudicators possess, um, I believe that uh, even though here the primary type of applicable sources of law are investment treaties, um, nevertheless. Um, we have this growing literature of, um, uh, that, that points to the increasing recognition of relevance of domestic laws uh, in the number of areas, um, from domestic legality in the due process condition for expropriation to the determination of remedies. So we have investment disputes in which the, the adjudicators actually have to consider also the, the, the components of domestic law um, uh, and also treat it as a law and not necessarily as a fact. So this leads me to the, uh, to, the, um, to the final consideration that I'm having. I fully agree with the, um, uh, with the diagnosis that, uh, that allowing for um, judges ad hoc in investor state disputes, if, especially if we allow only the states to appoint them, um, jeopardizes the equality of arms. But I think that this might come at an expense uh, of access to competences, to knowledge of the relevant uh, uh, law to be applied to the merits of the dispute. Um, because if we eliminate the, uh, the national judges trained primarily in the, um, in the law to be applied to the dispute, uh, it also means that the quality of, uh, of adjudicatory practice might, might suffer. Uh, this is a dilemma. I'm, uh, I, I don't know a good answer to that, but uh, I would be very happy to, uh, to, to hear your comments on that, especially in the context of the, uh, of the Uranovit Korea principle in, in um, investment adjudication. Thank you so much. It's been a great lecture and a great pleasure to be part of this event. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, before I take uh, questions from the rest of the audience, uh, Catherine, I don't know if you have uh, any reflections on, on these topics mm -hmm. that are brought up by Joanna. Yes, maybe a quick reaction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, your comments uh, were really interesting and really useful, especially as this is work in progress. Uh, so uh, 
uh, I have made notes as you, as you spoke. Um, I liked in particular your comment about independence and, uh, and neutrality, uh, how it is a, 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 a very uh, closely linked uh, consideration. Um, and uh, concerning uh, uh, your comment about um, uh, domestic law, the, in principle, I would expect that the multilateral court would not be able to apply domestic law. So strictly, that you would be able to consider it as a fact uh, rather than be able to apply it. The reason that I say this is that uh, uh, opinion um, uh, 117 of the, um, uh, the European Court of Human, oh, sorry, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, essentially um, will make it impossible for the EU to subscribe to a mechanism uh, that, um, uh, that allows an international court to apply domestic law, because there is uh, this question of the, the, the autonomy of the EU legal order. Uh, so uh, my assumption is that the EU is going to push for, um, for um, an international court, a multilateral court that cannot apply uh, domestic law. I, I fully agree that uh, uh, legal background is very, very important. Uh, and I will just use an example. I'm currently working on equity in international law. And uh, uh, I see, or I think I see differences between um, colleagues who come from common law jurisdictions uh, and um, colleagues like me who come from the civil law. Uh, and uh, people who come from common law jurisdictions because they've had equity courts and they've had this separation between uh, the common law and um, equity, uh, they seem to, to see equity, when applied at the international level, as something separate from the law. It's law, international law and equity. And I think um, those of us coming from civil law jurisdictions may be more likely to consider that equity is part of the law, uh, equity is part of international law in the same way that uh, uh, good faith is part of the law, even if it is not uh, spelled out. Uh, so I, I fully agree, this was to say that I fully agree that, um, that um, legal education, legal back and legal background uh, independent of nationality is a very important factor that somehow needs to be taken uh, into account. Uh, and uh, finally, thank you very much also for, uh, for discussing investment, uh, uh, in investment dispute settlement because I didn't have uh, the time to go through this and uh, it, it was very nice to, to hear these comments uh, about investment uh, dispute settlement. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for these uh, reflections. <clears throat> I will now uh, open up for questions from the audience and I, I could ask you maybe to please just uh, put a, a mark in the chat, uh, just a cross or something like that. Uh, if you have a question you want uh, to ask uh, to Catherine uh, after her presentation, please feel free to mark yourself out there. While you think about any questions, maybe I will introduce by asking one question. <clears throat> and uh, during your your presentation, um, you spoke of both uh, regular judges and ad hoc judges, and uh, you often spoke of it as uh, they would either be able to sit or to not sit on the bench, as it were. I was just wondering uh, whether there could be any uh, other way of participating uh, in the uh, adjudicative uh, process uh, whereby uh, national points of view uh, could be represented other than by having a judge which is actually sitting uh, on, on, the, on the panel, as it were, and having the power to participate in the decision. Uh, could it be possible to have, uh, for example, uh, uh, if you had a rule, for example, whereby judges from the um, disputing member states could not participate, but uh, they could uh, participate in the process uh, by giving, for example, advice or recommendations to the, to the judges. Um, this could perhaps enhance the legitimacy of the decisions while still retaining uh, equality of arms and also uh, some kind of a national influence, uh, not of course on a direct case, which is what I think most people would agree is a little bit illegitimate uh, if judges are used as agents for states to actually um, color the decisions. 
but rather as a way of mediating uh, the cultural understanding and, uh, and, and the background to the, the judges who would then decide. I was wondering if you had a, a comment to that. Thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, this is very interesting indeed. I admit I have not thought about this. Um, so my quick reaction is that it sounds like a great idea. I don't know how it works in terms of logistics. Um, how, because if we assume the judges already have a, a heavy workload, uh, do they, uh, uh, in order to be able to give advice, uh, does one have to be involved in the dispute in the sense that one has to know the facts? Or maybe you were talking about uh, giving an opinion uh, on a matter or on a point of law, uh, which would not actually uh, need to, in that case, the judge would not have to, to hear, the, to sit through the whole case. Uh, but I definitely think it's, it's a very interesting uh, idea. Uh, and uh, it could be an alternative to actually having uh, national judges or judges ad hoc in the way that we have them uh, today. Um, I have actually made a note of, of your comment and um, I am going to, to think about this. Thank, thank, thank you for that. I, I readily admit that uh, it's probably going to uh, in, incur f further resources uh, because, of, as, you made, as you point out correctly, I mean, judges are busy already. But uh, some kind of institutionalization and rotor system uh, within uh, courts could perhaps work. Uh, and it could also, uh, you know, may maybe in the longer run, even though it would, it would need uh, some more resources, it could uh, perhaps enhance the legitimacy and also the willingness of, uh, of member states to accept uh, th this. So it could actually advance the, I think it could advance the rule of law. Uh, meanwhile, I was wondering if uh, anybody else had questions they wanted to ask. Doesn't seem to be the case. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Alexander Shostak uh, from SHIELD and from Kozminsky yes. University. I will have uh, one brief uh, question to uh, Catherine. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, the points that you've raised are very important from academic, but also from practical perspective uh, and in daily practice of, of law. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, what uh, would, in your opinion, be the most um, efficient um, mechanism that could uh, effectively safeguard against bias of arbitrators uh, in the context of investment arbitration? So would it be, for example, more of um, procedural character in the sense of restricting party autonomy in appointing arbitrators and switching the burden um, to, to, for example, permanent uh, appointing authority, or would it be something more of substantive character? So, for example, um, implementing um, binding codes of conduct into the treaty text. Thank you, Catherine. Thank, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, you, you've raised a very interesting uh, uh, point and uh, one, of course, that is being discussed and uh, debated and, uh, uh, and states disagree about it in uh, Ancestral Working Group 3, uh, where the reform of investor state dispute settlement is being negotiated. Um, I'll start with your second point first. Um, I do think that uh, uh, substantive standards are very important. We have somehow focused uh, in investment, uh, in investment dispute settlement, uh, on uh, reform of um, investor state dispute settlement. So the procedural uh, standards, and uh, we have uh, we haven't really left aside substantive reform, but we have really uh, we have really focused, I think, a bit too much. Uh, on procedure, and we forget that uh, uh, international adjudicative bodies apply substantive provisions. Um, regarding um, uh, your comment about uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement, and I use investor state dispute settlement to cover both uh, arbitration and a potential court, um, the, the two systems really function uh, very differently. and. Uh, I think the biggest difference between the two is, in fact, the, um, 
the banner of uh, uh, selecting and appointing uh, the adjudicators. I think that's what makes uh, the biggest difference between arbitration uh, and between a court system. Uh, and um, um, I mean, there, there, are, there are pros and cons uh, in, uh, in both. I wouldn't like to take a position. In fact, I like both systems. Uh, I like arbitration. Arbitration is uh, something that uh, is a mechanism that has been used uh, since uh, well, since antiquity, but um, we we sometimes see arbitration as uh, uh, as uh, a something that comes from commercial arbitration, and we think it's inappropriate for public disputes. Uh, but in fact, uh, we have arbitration for interstate disputes. Uh, so there's nothing uh, surprising for me from a public international law point of view in having uh, arbitration as a dispute settlement mechanism uh, when addressing public law disputes. Uh, and, uh, and then on the other hand, uh, of course, the current tendency is to move away from arbitration uh, and to have uh, courts. Uh, court, international courts have pro proliferated and um, they have become more popular than arbitration uh, to decide uh, public international law disputes. Now, when we look at the arguments of, uh, of the, the different uh, um, players in Ancestral Working Group 3, um, they, rather when we look, if we look at the, the arguments of the European Union, uh, the European Union is in favor of a court system because it considers that, uh, uh, that independence and impartiality can, can only be guaranteed through a court system uh, and so on. Um, but of course, there, there are intermediate um, there are intermediate reforms uh, between arbitration and between a court system, and uh, I would like to to finish uh, with uh, end with uh, two points. Um, one is um, that uh, um, sometimes, depending on the particular uh, design of a of a court system or of arbitration, the difference between the two uh, is not that important. So again, if we think of uh, uh, judges ad hoc uh, used in divisions of three, uh, where we have a president who is a regular judge and, uh, uh, and then the other two uh, judges are either a judge ad hoc or a, a national judge, um, then I mean, how different is that from, from arbitration? Uh, and um, the, the second point, and I will close with this, is that um, in the current uh, reform efforts, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, some states are in favor of um, arbitration and some states and the European Union are in favor of a court system. And uh, it seems to me that at this moment, these positions are not going to be reconciled. There are some countries uh, such as the United States that I think will continue to be in favor of arbitration and not want to subscribe to, a, to an investment court. Uh, and uh, possibly the European Union um, won't want to subscribe to arbitration. Uh, so we are likely to have both options and then uh, every party is gonna say that their option is the, the most appropriate one. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, time is uh, passing uh, fast when you are in good company. And uh, we actually have only a, a few minutes left of uh, the seminar today. I have to run to uh, another meeting uh, after this. So I'm afraid I have to uh, check out now. Uh, but uh, Joanna, I think I will leave it to you just to uh, to close the seminar maybe with a, with a final word. And so you just have to unmute, Joanna. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so so I will be checking out now. Thank you very much, Henry. Okay. Yes. Thank you all for joining us today. So Henry, and, uh, thank you so much for chairing the uh, the seminar. Uh, and uh, please allow me to thank Catherine very warmly for being our guest today, for uh, for being the guest of the Faculty of Law, University of Copenhagen, the guest of Shield uh, and uh, and iCourts. Uh, it's been great to have you in our lecture series on transformations uh, of global economic governance. Uh, we're also very much looking forward to to further events to come in this uh, uh, in this series. And uh, uh, please allow me to thank all the participants of, uh, of today's lecture. Uh, we very much hope that you will stay with us also for the future SHIELD events to, uh, to come. 
Catherine, many thanks for uh, accepting our invitation and many thanks also to the uh, European Society of International Law that has been our co-host um, uh, today. John, if I may just also uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's truly a pleasure uh, to, to be here, uh, even if uh, from a distance. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much also for the invitation to, to be a, a visiting uh, scholar at the university. Uh, and hopefully I will make it uh, as soon as the, the COVID-19 crisis is over. Uh, thank you very much to, to everyone who has been here. And finally, I, I forgot to thank at the very beginning, uh, Joyce and Demeter uh, from the ESIL Secretariat, uh, who uh, have also helped with uh, putting up the information and, uh, uh, and uh, um, I don't know, preparing the, the website for uh, the website, the web page on the ESIL uh, website uh, for the event. Uh, so uh, truly thank you. And it has been a, a pleasure uh, being here. Thank you so much.